Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Khalil Gibran Muhammad. I am the Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I direct the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project. Today's discussion, Getting at the Root, is being hosted by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and is co-sponsored by the Carr Center for Human Rights at the Harvard Kennedy School. Before introductions, I want to start with a few announcements for the IRA project and the Ash Center. We would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional and unceded territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meaning and exchange among nations. Today's event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center's YouTube channel. You are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event, please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them via the chat. I just want to say for me personally, as a historian, I have so much to learn from this conversation and I think the broader work that the IRA project is engaged in in learning about various processes of truth equity and reconciliation around the globe brings us to a key moment in transforming the patterns and practices of human rights investigations that have long shielded the United States from scrutiny. And while there's a lot to be learned that will help and assist justice in other parts of the world, I know for me it's also important to make sure that as we move into the rest of this century, the United States has a chance to learn from the way freedom fighters and other justice advocates have been able to do some good in other parts of the world. Indeed, today's event is important and timely. Finally, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. I want to start with Dr. Gloria Ayi. She's a lecturer and a Harvard College Fellow in the Department of Government at Harvard University and a faculty associate at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also happy to say she'll be helping us out too as a fellow soon enough. Lisa LaPlante, or Lisa LaPlante is a professor of law at New England Law School, Boston, where she also directs the Center for International Law and Policy. And our last panelist is Kile Bugili Zrobo, or Dr. Kile, is an assistant professor of government at William and Mary a faculty affiliate at the Global Research Institute and the founder and director of the International Justice Lab. Lastly, but certainly not least, is my colleague, Erica Licht, who is the director of research projects at the IRA Project. I am really grateful that all of you joined us for this conversation. Thanks so much, Khalil, and good afternoon to everyone tuning in. Um, we have a really sizable crowd with us today, and uh, we're so excited to be in conversation with three really amazing women scholars um, and uh, who represent both a range of academic disciplines as well as um, areas of study within this umbrella of um, justice, accountability, and truth-telling. So um, welcome to all of you at home tuning in. And for those of you in the Northeast, um, hope that you are um, being warm uh, as you join us today. Um, as Khalil mentioned at IRA, you know, we think a lot about accountability. It's in our name, it's in our acronym. And so we're well aware that um, you know, both the practice of um, truth commissions as well as you know, the study of them has you know, been uh, manifesting over the last you know, 30 years. For us today, this conversation is so meaningful um, when we think about what a justice and accountability can look like um, both in practice and process, but also to question you know, whether they are possible in reality and not just face value. At IRA, you know, we study the commitments that organizations in the US make to racial justice and equity. And this larger project for us of understanding the global landscape of these processes um, really enables us to honestly take a humble role in being learners um, you know, from the three of you and many others who have um, been critically studying you know, what we should be learning. So I'll start um, 
first uh, for Dr. Ayi, I'd love for you to set the stage for us, um, for new listeners coming into this conversation on truth commissions, transitional justice terms, which we're you know hearing a buzz, especially in U.S. jargon more recently. Um, can you give us a sense of the history, you know, of this field um, as a theory and practice, and and what it's looked like on the global scale? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about transitional justice and accountability and uh, human rights issues uh, in the United States and globally. Uh, first, I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Khalil, uh, Sushma, Erica, and the rest of the IRA team. Um, and also, I just want to say it's, it's such a great honor to be in conversation with Kelly and Lisa, scholars whose work I have um, admired uh, for some time now. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, to answer your question, Erica, uh, let me just say that it is not easy to provide a comprehensive picture of the history and current state of transitional justice in just a few minutes, um, but I would like to provide some important context and background for our audience to kick off today's discussion. So um, for those who may not be familiar with the term transitional justice, I would um, explain that it is not a special type of justice like distributive justice, organizational justice, um, procedural justice, for example. Rather, transitional justice refers to short-term, often temporary judicial and non-judicial mechanisms and processes that are implemented to address legacies of conflict, human rights, abuse, and other violence. These mechanisms can aid in a society's transition from conflict or authoritarian rule to post-conflict democracy. Transitional justice also includes efforts to provide redress to victims of systematic state-sponsored human rights violations. And the approach to justice creates or augments opportunities for the transformation of political systems. It also aids in the mitigation of conflicts and seeks to prevent their recurrence. Um, which is very important, of course. Transitional justice is rooted in accountability, um, a chief concern in our conversation today, and the redress for victims because it specifically recognizes the dignity of victims as citizens and as human beings. So I would like to backtrack a little bit and provide our audience with a brief history of the development of the field of transitional justice. The field first appeared um, or emerged in the late 1980s and early 1990s, primarily in response to the political transitions that were taking place in Latin America and Eastern Europe. Uh, so scholars in the West, um, American academics to be um, specific, coined the term to describe um, efforts undertaken by countries to deal with the problems of new, um, often post-authoritarian regimes that had to find compelling and legitimate avenues for addressing serious crimes and human rights violations. Uh, during this period, scholars became more interested in examining, understanding, and evaluating how newly formed states in the former Soviet Union were confronting their complicated legacies and emerging from um, periods of totalitarianism. So as the field grew, it um, incorporated uh, justice measures that were taking place not only in Latin America and Eastern Europe, as I mentioned, but also justice efforts in Africa and Asia. And some trans transitional justice approaches have also been employed in North America. Um, we can talk about the Canadian truth and reconciliation process, which completed um, its, its efforts in 2015 as an example, but other um, more local truth commission efforts in the United States um, are of importance as well. Speaking of truth commissions, I'll just quickly shift gears and end with some comments on these mechanisms. Um, in its expanded form, truth, uh, tr truth commissions are uh, an element of transitional justice 
or a, a mechanism of transitional justice. And while there is no definitive definition for a truth commission that is accepted by all scholars, I find it helpful to conceptualize a truth commission as a temporary uh, investigative body with a specific mandate that is established to investigate, document, and address systematic human rights violations that have occurred in a nation that was either deeply divided by political violence or um, was uh, trying to uh, create some form of unification and promote healing and reconciliation. Truth commissions are quasi-judicial in their structure and they take a victim-centric approach to justice through their emphasis on restorative justice practices and the focus on the testimony of victims. Um, there has been a proliferation of truth commissions globally over the past uh, 40 to 50 years in both transitional and non-transitional um, political context. And these types of commissions have been established in over 30 countries um, with the uh, a uh, global distribution of national truth commissions um, being concentrated in the global south. So we have approximately 38% um, of truth commissions established in Africa, 21% in South America, 12% in Central um, America and the Caribbean, and about 18% in East and Southeast Asia. So um, transitional justice can employ um, other uh, efforts, other measures like um, tr truth telling, memorialization, restorative and retributive justice, but truth commissions have started to play a really central role in this um, transitional justice toolkit. Thank you so much, Gloria. I think that really lays the landscape for us really well. Um, and what's so exciting about having the three of you here today is each of you, I think both in work and programming and research are really convening this knowledge and thinking about um, you know, I'm thinking of you, Lisa, and your center's work to bring together a series. Kelly, I'm thinking of your work to kind of create um, an anthology, really, of study of the U.S. commissions that we've seen. And, and Gloria, I know a lot of your initial work was thinking of, like, how can we compare these truth commissions um, up against each other in terms of, you know, the mechanisms, as you mentioned, that they've utilized. Um, you know, you mentioned these themes of um, restoring or, or trying to restore dignity for victims um, and, and potentially creating healing, potentially creating reconciliation. I'm really excited to dig into those themes with you all today, because I think often for many of these commissions, we put them in some ways um, on a pedestal and, and have it necessarily with the kind of a sharp lens, you know, critically um, you know, asked, you know, did healing occur? Did reconciliation occur? Um, what do victims themselves have to say? Um, so I think that's a nice transition um, to you, Lisa. Um, can you give us a sense of what happens when a truth commission finishes mm -hmm. its work? I know that's something you've looked at in your research. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about what mechanisms um, specifically have existed for truth commissions to, in theory, at least stand by the recommendations that they make. So and for what Gloria told us, you know, the, the commission chooses its kind of purview of violence or harm it's looked at, it's conducted its activities. There's often like a final report, some sort of kind of finale, um, either statements or gestures. Uh, give us a sense of the the what's next and and what we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, one of the most important takeaways, probably from my work, is realizing that the Truth Commission is often just the beginning. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on Truth Commissions; they are important, um, but I view them as almost the jump starting of a transitional justice process. And Gloria, thank you so much for that introduction to the field, generally speaking, which I think as scholars, uh, we're, we're always grappling whether there really is a uniform definition because uh, it's often just about the mechanisms. And I think we're okay with that because each case is different, each context is different, but there are some general takeaways uh, that I can share with regard to the fact that truth commissions, generally speaking, um, you know, they, they're an organic process, the first ones, 
uh, in particular in Latin America, we think of the Argentinian Truth Commission on the Disappeared included recommendations. And then each new Truth Commission learns from the next. And, and so at this point in time, Truth Commissions, when they're set up, um, tend to understand that they need to end up with recommendations. Now keep in mind, in part, their definition, if you go with Priscilla Hayner's definition, is short term. They have very little time to not only collect all of these testimonies, private and public, to study the historical context that their mandate includes, which for the most part has been short term. Uh, I would say on average, typically not more than a couple of decades, but that's still a lot of work to do in a couple of years, and then to come up with these recommendations. So there's a whole range of recommendations. Uh, and um, my work has primarily been on the theme of reparations, in particular, really focusing in Latin America and Peru is where I got my start. And, and why this is important is uh, one of the, the first studies I did when working uh, with the Peruvian Truth Commission was to to talk to those people who were selected in particular at public hearings to give their testimony. And what I discovered is most people who participate in the truth process do it because they're expecting change. Um, they're often expecting reparations. The one person I interviewed had a very now famous case in the Inter-American uh, uh, Human Rights System had already received reparations. For her, it was important to tell her truth um, that she had already been uh, repaired, so to speak. Um, so reparations is one of the outcomes. Institutional reform is another one with the idea of looking at the, the state apparatus, whether it be the, um, the people that need to be trained, so police, military, uh, the institutions that need to be reformed, the laws that need to be changed. So some kind of uh, lasting change, because obviously it was the conditions in place that often led to just horrific human rights violations. Other um, types of outcomes more frequently now are criminal justice recommendations. There's a whole history of uh, transitional justice being a reaction to the lack of the ability to have criminal trials, and that's really changed in a short amount of time. Um, and other kinds of measures that may be considered um, to prevent future occurrences, so education, uh, cultural changing. I just want to um, make sure to recognize a great new database. Um, in addition to Kelly's, we've got all of a sudden all these great resources beyond words. Um, my colleagues, Scar Weibelhaus Braun and Garcia Godos, um, and they have a forthcoming, a couple of forthcoming books studying the outcomes of truth commissions in Latin America. And they have documented, I think, about a thousand recommendations and what, what they conclude is it's better than we thought. We're often very cynical about whether these are actually implemented. They found a higher percentage are implemented and, and they get into some of the conditions for when and why that's possible. So that's just kind of a brief overview of what can be expected um, from truth commissions in addition to usually some kind of permanent body to assure their implementation. Thank you. And I really, I hope we can circle back to that question of the permanent body um, later in our conversation, because I think that's a really uh, important um, touchstone of this question of accountability. You know, what exists, wh whether that or other mechanisms exist in the five, 10 plus years, um, you know, to, to ensure the accountability of the, re the recommendations of the findings themselves. So I'm so glad you mentioned um, you know, Kelly's work again, and in context also with the last two years, you know, since June 2020 of a explosion, if you will, of attention to these processes. Now, obviously, the three of you were doing this work and research long before um, 2020 and the horrific murder of uh, and lynching, modern day lynching of, of George Floyd and other Black Americans at the hands of police. Um, now, certainly George Floyd, the subsequent um, uprisings and protests, you know, have given rise to attention, greater public discourse and attention to racial justice. Um, and, and also just considerations of how other countries have sought to, quote unquote, deal, you know, with their um, past or current forms of harm and violence. So we've really seen, you know, an explosion. I you know many of us have been, the, the four of us included on events, calls, series, panels. It's in some ways been just, for me, such a nourishing um, place to both think and also really meaningfully hear, as particularly from those 
um, who've been involved as architects in these processes or as, you know, uh, beneficiaries or, or impacted. So Kelly, I'd love to hear for you, you know, your recent research and, and along with the other areas you've looked at, um, you, you know, you've sought to make some of these connections between what we should learn or, or try to be learning from global examples of truth commissions. Um, and in addition, you've also done this, you know, wonderful new undertaking to document the extent of U.S.-based truth commissions, you know, often on the local level, but also, um, you know, Kerner and others that have been more national. When just thinking about the global, though, um, you know, and what are the lessons we should be learning? And again, even the failures, um, but what we should be taking away as we think about these, these processes, the range that Gloria's told us about, um, you know, what should we be learning and, and, and maybe begin to tell us a bit about what are those implications um, for the U.S. itself? Thanks, Erica, um, and thanks to Khalil, Sushma, my fellow co-panelists um, for joining in this really uh, important uh, conversation and really set of conversations. Uh, so right now I am working um, on a book um, with an August 1 deadline, and so if you need me, I'll be under my rock. Otherwise, besides this panel, I'm working on that, um, and it's called Governing Truth, NGOs, and the Politics of Transitional Justice. And these are some of my, uh, my findings um, looking at global cases um, of transitional justice, but especially of truth commissions. And so uh, this uh, project is built on uh, several new important pieces of data. The first, identifying a universe of truth commissions um, in the um, 80 plus range um, in different countries um, around the world since 1970 that uh, pass um, Hainer's definition, uh, going back um, to, to Lisa's comment about a temporary body created by national government to investigate events in the past to um, uh, to establish a pattern of abuse and to do so while engaging with the affected population. So those are kind of the five um, uh, pillars or um, or uh, components uh, of the, um, the definition of a truth commission that I think a lot of us work with. And um, there are others um, that I think are pretty complementary. Some people say the commission has to have a report and all these different things. But for the most part, I think these five um, are, are pretty, um, are pretty central. And um, so, so that was, you know, the first um, task identifying a universe of commissions, and basically why we see commissions in some places and not in others and being able to extrapolate that story to other TJ mechanisms. And then also why some commissions are designed uh, to succeed, <laughs> um, while others are not, um, in terms of having key investigative powers, jurisdictional powers, what you can look at, um, and then also um, operational powers, how you can look at things. Do you have subpoena powers? Can you preserve your own evidence, those type of things? And then finally, um, how um, commissions are implemented and crucially, uh, what comes after? Why do uh, the results of some processes, that is the findings and recommendations, um, materialize or yield uh, implementation, so this follow-up while others do not. And the through line connecting these um, is civil society. A strong, robust civil society is necessary, although not sufficient, it's not a sufficient condition for a robust TJ process from adoption to design uh, to implementation and follow-up. And that civil society at the domestic level, but then also at the international level. So I advance this burden sharing model um, of transnational advocacy where domestic groups and international groups are leveraging their comparative advantages at these different stages um, of transitional justice processes with domestic groups being really important for that adoption stage international groups like the International Center for Transitional Justice, which a lot of us have worked with um, and are in conversation with, really important for um, a strong design. And then back to domestic groups for that implementation and follow up um, because a, um, to, you know, go back as far as, um, you know, wrist drop and sick ink, you know, in the 90s, um, uh, the um, 
uh, uh, human rights, and here I will um, command, find, replace human rights and put in transitional, ju uh, transitional justice, right, depends on the persistent activism of, um, of, domestic, um, of domestic groups. And so, like I said, um, focusing on truth conditions, but being able to tell this broader um, story of transitional justice. That's the first thing, civil society. And uh, that's not just you know civil society being strong on its own, but also civil society being enabled to be the representatives of the affected community. So governments allowing for a, a role um, for civil society as a truth commission or other process um, is being rolled out. Often when we see civil society marginalized, um, that process is probably not going to yield, you know, good um, results. And so I'm thinking most recently of Côte d'Ivoire, where there was, you know, virtually, you know, no victim testimony, not really meaningful engagement um, of the affected population and kind of the sidelining of civil society in that process. All right, that's the first thing. A second thing um, for, um, for truth commissions and other participatory modes um, of transitional justice, they must be facilitated in the case of, um, of survivors and victims' families. That means providing psychosocial support before, during, and after, for example, their own delivery of testimony or even their taking in of testimony um, from, um, from perpetrators um, and others privacy, safety, confidentiality when it is needed, when it is required, and also an understanding of what people are, are expect from the process. So Sierra Leone is another case kind of going um, back to, to Lisa's point about people telling their truth with an expectation of some result. And so there, you know, it was like, come to the Truth Commission and, you know, and benefit from the truth telling process. Well, um, for some people, the idea of benefit sparked the idea that there would be some type of reparations that would be provided. So people go and they express these harrowing experiences and then nothing happened. And that was, you know, definitely um, was disappointing. I think for some people um, undermined their trust um, in the process. Um, and um, on the perpetrator side, uh, it must be uh, induced, right? So whether that's carrots or sticks, Subpoena powers are important and they deliver results um, if courts are backing up um, uh, truth commissions, for example. Um, we can talk about amnesties, very controversial now, right? Um, with the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court and kind of some, you know, um, more modern uh, jurisprudence uh, post 2000 that, you know, amnesties uh, don't count as accountability, but, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to put a pin in that, but amnesties, um, conditional amnesties, truth for amnesty deals do work. Now, whether or not we want to use them is a, uh, is a different question entirely. Uh, just last couple of things, um, and then uh, really looking forward to um, continue this conversation and uh, responses, remarks, et cetera, from the co-panelists and also um, from you, Erica, and this idea of recommendations. And I'm thinking right now of the late, the now late Archbishop Desmond Tutu and one of his great disappointments with the South African government since the Truth Commission concluded was the lack of follow-up on recommendations, right? Now, the story is not so bleak, like Truth Commission recommendations are never implemented. But in my own research, really finding that it's a, it's a minority of recommendations that are initiated and that are implemented fully, right? So it's not just, oh, we made one memorial park, but we didn't you know, do this times 10 in the other relevant municipalities where abuses happened, right? And so that long-term follow through, right? That long-term impact of truth commissions, I believe um, is undermined uh, when their recommendations are not implemented. And this brings me to reconciliation. I will conclude here. Uh, a lot of people, especially policymakers, um, love to talk about truth and reconciliation. There is about one empirical study that I believe about the truth reconciliation connection, and that is James Gibson's um, Overcoming Apartheid, where he's able to operationalize. What is reconciliation? Okay, we can talk about interpersonal reconciliation. We can talk about political tolerance, you know, kind of breaking that down. But the empirical, um, uh, but the empirical record does not support reconciliation, but that's actually fine, right? Because um, I think we can, because since um, I think about 2006, um, groups like the International Center for Transitional Justice, even earlier, have tried to decouple truth from reconciliation. If you think about it, um, a truth commission is just 
um, a temporary government agency. And so when have we ever relied on temporary government offices to produce something as impactful as reconciliation, right? And so there's been this decoupling. So we, you, you'll, um, to the audience, you'll hear us talking about truth commissions and not truth and reconciliation commissions, even if that is in their name, right? Um, truth is a necessary condition, I believe, for, recon for reconciliation, but it is not sufficient um, on its own. Um, it can be a goal, and, and I think it creates permissive conditions for reconciliation, but it should not be an expectation of policymakers, even activists, that is put onto the affected community, in particular survivors and victims' families, because we should probably ask them if that is what they want and what they would need for reconciliation to be possible. And Interpersonal reconciliation, while very important, does not necessarily scale up without um, state remedies, right? And so that's why, you know, you can't just say, you know, this person shared their story, this person shared their story, there was an apology, they forgave, and that was it, because South Africa, everyone's favorite poster child of truth commissions, uh, the views now, you know, 20 plus years later, almost 30 years later, um, since the commission uh, are, yeah, much, um, they're, uh, the truth commission is not remembered today as it was experienced then because the material conditions of black and other non-white South Africans have not been changed. There are still persistent inequalities, especially when it comes um, to, to resources and land and wealth, et cetera. And so, you know, what did the Truth Commission do for us? It was very important for nation building, maybe not for reconciliation, for addressing systemic inequalities and um, for, um, yeah, for, for this transformation um, of South African society beyond who is in power. Well, thank you, Kelly, so much. I think you've given us a lot to chew on um, in that response alone. Um, and uh, just some of the things in what you just said reverberating for me include, um, I mean, particularly this question of the change in material conditions. Um, of, of the reality for, you know, for harmed people, for people who continue to be not only marginalized in society, but experience the inequity of, you know, policies, you know, that, that impact the, the, the conditions of day-to-day -day life and accessing education, healthcare, um, the ability to own a business, to rent a home, buy a home, et cetera. So, again, those are applicable to South Africa, as you've mentioned, and many other cases, as well as is when we begin to talk about the US and the ways that in particular, you know, black people, indigenous native people have been harmed by, you know, histories of violence um, and exploitation and also the ways that, you know, um, they continue to be. Um, I also just wanna pick up on this note of um, the distinction you've made for us between interpersonal or uh, community-based reconciliation, both as a feel-good concept, <laughs> Um, but also as one that doesn't acknowledge, you know, the fullness of systemic harm. Um, and so, you know, when we think about systemic racism in the U.S., for instance, um, you know, we can think about, and there's a great graphic from Race Forward, you know, a U.S. racial justice group that really encourages people to think about, you know, the, the structural, institutional the societal, the interpersonal, and the personal, all the different ways that racism impacts, you know, on these different levels and dimensions. And, you know, we could apply the same model to, to particularly to any form of ethnic, religious, um, racial, or otherwise based, you know, identity markers um, that have existed in these other global examples. Um, and particularly, as you've mentioned, when, um, in my words, <laughs> we've let the the the, uh, the people with power, the identities that do hold power, off the hook, you know, in being a part of and holding their feet to the fire of these processes, whether as perpetrators, but also just as you know, willing bystanders um, to harm. So that might be a good transition, uh, although it's I, I know going to be tough to kind of. Again, I'm, I'm asking all of you to squeeze in a lot of findings and a lot of thoughts into you know, these, these short responses. Um, and I just wanna also mention, we're seeing some great questions from the audience, which I'll also um, begin to weave in. So when we think about the US, um, 
I, I'm going to turn back to you, Kelly, first. Um, what is what precedence do we have? What what commissions um, have existed both on the local or national level? Um, I know I see some people in, in the chat asking about January 6th, the insurrection, whatever, <laughs> however you want to refer to it. Um, but I think what's important, and you know, I work with a historian, so I, I clearly I have to remember history for good reason on a day to day basis. We have, you know, examples in our past, and as you've written about, including the Kerner Commission, um, that have at least in some ways sought to identify, document, and report out on violence and harm, particular and, and uh, systemic inequities, particularly for Black Americans. Um, thinking about this history in the U.S. that you've looked at of commissions, um, what lessons might we consider um, for the efforts um, that we're seeing today or, or, or in the future? Yeah, so there are a lot of great examples uh, of truth commissions and other TJ processes in the U.S. going back as far as 1967 with the Kerner Commission or the Commission on Civil Disturbances that was looking at, um, you know, a spate of racial violence um, across the U.S. in 67, um, but in particular um, in, uh, in, in Michigan and uh, in, in, in New Jersey. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that was inaugurated by President Johnson and looked not only at the violence of 67, but also the political, economic and social um, antecedents, we might say. Um, and so that's how I'm able um, to count that as, um, as a truth commission, as meeting Hainer's um, five part definition, save for one criterion, which is that, uh, or actually in that case, it was a national, um, national government. But in how I've been looking at U.S. truth commissions is actually being able to relax that criterion that a truth commission must do created by a national government, because truth commissions can be created by subnational governments at the state level, the county level, and the city level. And, you know, for some in the audience, I would say, oh, oh, oh you can't start counting subnational truth commissions. And I say, yes, we can, because we love to talk about Colombia and all of the complementary institutions that are being implemented there. And that includes the state level, um, at the national level, and the subnational level. Likewise, in Brazil, and the local turn, we've been talking about it in TJ for a really long time. So at least on that on that dimension alone, we should not be excluding the US case from the, uh, you could say the global genealogy um, of truth commissions and of transitional justice, even though it is not a paradigmatic case. It is not a case of transitional justice in the aftermath of an armed conflict or in the aftermath of an authoritarian regime, but rather in a standing um, democracy. Um, and again, also there, we should um, still count the US because we love to talk about Canada's truth and reconciliation process. Um, Gloria mentioned the commission there and most recently um, ending in 20. Um, in 2019 was the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Uh, likewise, the commissions that we study in South Korea um, and elsewhere. And so um, what we've been learning, um, so uh, in my lab, the International Justice Lab, we've undertaken several data collection um, endeavors to try and understand U.S. transitional justice, U.S. truth commissions. And this is um, what we've uncovered. So 20 past, present, and proposed U.S. truth commissions at the national level, so like the Kerner Commission, but then also the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians from 1980 that was looking at World War II era persecution of Japanese Americans to the state level. So there was um, the Maine Wabanaki State Children's Welfare Commission in Maine that was looking at removal of Indigenous children from their homes and communities and their placement into the Maine foster care system and just the violence um, and harm that um, they experienced um, throughout that process and also cultural erasure um, to, ev to even... Um, the city level, so looking, for example, on the Tulsa Commission on um, the race riots, right? Um, and so there's kind of, you know, national level, um, state level, um, city level, county level, Alachua County, just lots of different, um, lots of different uh, mechanisms and some currently proposed um, in Congress. So a US Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Commission proposed by Barbara Lee in the House and Cory Booker in the Senate. And then also the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policy proposed by then Congresswoman Deb Haaland, now um, Secretary of the Interior and then um, and Senator Elizabeth Warren. Um, 
but these um, all U.S. truth commissions, unsurprisingly, I think to uh, people uh, on this call, um, are about racial violence because that is our particular um, flavor, let's say, in the U.S. of political violence. And so all of them touch on racial violence, um, oftentimes anti-Indigenous and anti-Black violence, but also in some cases anti-Asian violence. In the case of the um, of the uh, commission on wartime relocation and internment of civilians, and um, you know, we're moving beyond just looking at killings, which was a big, which was the focus in the past, to issues of systemic inequality, systemic racism. Um, and so it's an interesting um, expansion that I think is important, including more groups, including more issues. And I think it'll be interesting to see these newer commissions um, as they conduct their work, as they issue recommendations, and very importantly, if their recommendations are going, um, are going to be implemented. Um, my only concern, or I have many concerns, but one big concern of mine is the involvement of civil society in these processes and um, the involvement of expert groups like the ICTJ that I really think should be involved and have not been involved um, uh, as much as they could, not because of um, their lack of interest, but because of um, maybe some of these connections not being forged um, by Truth Commission inaugurators and designers at the local level. So really, you know, should be calling up Miriam Roccatello and her team um, and others at ICTJ because they have a lot to teach from global precedent. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I think it speaks to both the, the willingness to really look either these histories of violence and harm and current realities of violence and harm in the face, you know, um, is there will there, right? Is there a willingness and and to be with both the discomfort of those realities, um, as well as, as you said, build on the expertise and the wisdom of, you know, those who have engaged in this work prior. Um, I think this mention of the collaboration between different actors is really important. I know something that we've been finding, you know, in our own research is, just, for instance, in the Canadian example is education reforms. Like, how are you directly paying attention to the curriculum and, you know, what goes into, um, you know, the education of Canadian children explicitly in regards to the history, the realities of the history of harm to Indigenous and Native people. Um, I also have to mention the example that always sticks with me are the stumbling blocks in Germany, you know, the type of memorialization that that forces you, sorry, my computer literally just stumbled, that that forces you to literally kind of stop in your tracks um, and 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 I don't want to say reckon, so to speak, but really kind of uh, re reminds, actively reminds um, while documenting. Um, I'm going to come to you, Gloria, in a second to talk more about accountability, um, but I wanted to, because I know, I think connected to what we're hearing about, um, you've also been involved in um, efforts of mapping to uh, document where we are seeing truth commissions, and I think that that work, in addition to the convenings um, that New England Law School has been having of, um, you know, practitioners, uh, I'm thinking of Eduardo Gonzalez, among many other, you know, amazing leaders and voices. Um, Lisa, can you give us a sense of, you know, what you've been finding or learning at these recent convenings, um, as well as this landscape, particularly of mapping uh, these efforts? Absolutely. Thank you. So I already put the link in the chat, but uh, in the summer of 2020, I uh, I and some other colleagues started just a conversation about how we could contribute to what we recognized was really a window of opportunity to move forward with this idea, the concepts of transitional justice it has grown exponentially way beyond my original um, thoughts of what it could be. And, and one of it is a speaker series that is now in its second year. I did include a, a link, there's recordings and current um, uh, panels coming up, which is done collaboratively with almost 40 co-sponsoring institutions. And we're trying to hit upon some key themes as it relates to the US, but bringing in a comparative perspective when possible. February 28th, we're looking at whether police accountability contributes or not to racial reckoning. Um, we're hoping to have another one in April on mental health and resilience 
especially those involved in these initiatives. Um, and so hopefully some of the participants will be interested in joining us for that conversation. And, and hopefully it's ongoing with the Zoom, the new, the new online culture, we may be able to continue with these uh, conversations moving forward. Um, as a part of this, we're also, we also created a TJ in the USA network, which is a listserv and we do weekly news briefings on uh, current events in the US related to these themes. And based on that, um, my students have done um, nothing compared to what Kelly has done with her comprehensive database, but we have tried to track the development of initiatives. We, we are not as strict with our Priscilla Hayner definition. So, um, you know, it's more local initiatives, some federal that are looking at starting truth initiatives, reparation initiatives. And we just actually um, collaborated with the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton. I'm putting the link to start mapping, a visual mapping of these initiatives. Um, but I can give you some really astonishing statistics, uh, which is we have so far mapped, um, and some of these are the same that Kelly has looked at, um, but 11 proposed, 12 in their early development, 20 that are um, pretty developed and seven that are concluded. Now, many of these started happening after 2020, which is just astonishing. We're just starting to do some of the deep diving that Kelly has already done with some really detailed um, uh, logs. The students are looking at mandates and, and you know what, what they're focused on. And, and so I can't offer that yet, um, but we'll hopefully have it posted on the uh, TJ in the USA website at my institution. But the takeaway really is that there's something going on um, and, you know, we can't ignore it anymore. And, and the news alerts, it's, it's a part of our, our, our national conversation, which it wasn't uh, until just recently, which is amazing. So that there's a summary of the work. Thank you. Absolutely. And a documentary actually that Gloria, um, you know, really encouraged me to, to finally sit down and watch Dawn Land, you know, is an example of, first of all, a beautiful film, but also an effort to document a recent, you know, localized state level truth commission um, here in the United States and Maine for Wabanaki people impacted by violent policies through the early 2000s, right? And to, I think through the film in particular, um, really have the viewer understand, you know, so much of the, the multiple dimensions of both harm and repair required um, that we're talking about. Um, uh, I also just want to mention, I think, you know, in, uh, in thinking about, you know, those harmed and those responsible, there's also Again, the those at large, you know, in a society um, who need to reckon with and you know um, have the understanding cultivated in terms of you know the historical realities of society. I'm thinking in the U.S. explicitly about white people, you know, about white Americans um, being you know uh, just as you know at stake for uh, for creating racial justice change as you know obviously also eliminating the harm for black indigenous and people of color at the leadership of black indigenous and people of color on these efforts um so Gloria um, I love I'm sorry we haven't you know heard from you since uh, since prior I really want to pass the mic to you now um and think about, we, we're talking about accountability. Who's watched the U.S.? So the U.S. has long had a role in holding other countries accountable, so to speak. Many U.S. ambassadors, envoys, et cetera, were actually key architects or key um, leaders of these international truth commissions that we're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, when we when we think about this role that the U.S. has had, um, who has kept the U.S. accountable? And to quote my middle school Latin days, <laughs> we've used the expression here at IRA, the, the Latin expression, and again, I'm you know, going to not say this correctly, uh, he's custodiat ipsos custodes. So who will guard the guards themselves? The U.S. has uh, put its foot in, in many places as the guard. Um, help us understand is there or should there be uh, a means for uh, the U.S. to also be guarded, so to speak? That is an excellent question and um, one that we we as a nation have to really grapple with. Um, in terms of accountability, uh, we can think about 
uh, not only the US, but other Western nations. But um, of course, we're, we're talking about what is happening in the US as, as it relates to um, human rights uh, violations committed by the state itself, both within the United States, so domestically and then abroad. Um, so we know that um, in terms of accountability with, with superpowers, it's often really difficult to, to hold these nations accountable. But um, we can think about the work of um, international um, bodies like the UN um, and the ICC, but also um, the work of other nations um, in holding the United States accountable. And I'll, I'll um, briefly touch on the ways in which um, this has been done and also the possibilities for um, accountability. So we, we can think about the UN Human Rights Committee, which has in the past um, really uh, criticized the US government for its, its role in perpetrating um, human rights violations. Um, the, U, the United States has also been criticized by human rights experts um, on its compliance with the International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights, which is um, one of only a few international human rights treaties that the US has ratified. And um, the US has been criticized over things like its immigration policies and treatment of migrants. Um, racial disparities in the criminal justice system, disenfranchisement of individuals who have been charged with felonies, um, and of course, also um, in, in recent years, counterterrorism operations and the use of torture, as well as the practice of extraordinary rendition, which is the U.S government sponsored program that involves um, the abduction and transferring of individuals from um, one country to another. Um, this program has drawn widespread criticism. So um, in terms of holding um, the, the United States accountable for these types of violations, um, it's possible that um, sanctions could be um, issued to pressure the US into changing its actions, but that is highly unlikely. And so what other nations have tried to do, for example, is naming and shaming using that approach to call out the US for its, its um, human rights violations, but um, with limited success, of course. And then we know that um, uh, the International Criminal Court, the ICC has been really um, invested in um, holding uh, perpetrators of human rights violations and, and states accountable. Um, and while the US is not a state party to the Rome Statute of the ICC, um, even though it really helped in, in setting up the, the court, um, there are some limited situations in which the ICC will have jurisdiction over nationals of countries such as the US who have not joined the Rome Statute. So when, when um, we have um, citizens committing war crimes or crimes against humanity and genocide um, on the, ter the territory of an ICC member country, those people could be brought before the court. So US citizens could be held responsible. So the, the, the main issue is how do we hold the United States as a state um, responsible or accountable? And that is an ongoing conversation that um, we, can, we can really um, focus on. Thank you. Well, hopefully that's the work of the um, 300 or so people in attendance here today, um, but also those who will who will tune in to the recording, which to answer all the questions will be posted and, and emailed af out after this. Um, I, I want to weave in some questions um, directly that we've been getting, which I've also been trying to do in, in what I've posed to you all. Um, I just have to say, I don't, I don't know if we'll answer it head on, but uh, one person asked, how do you work in this space with its overwhelmingly difficult issues and slow pace without falling into despair? <laughs> um, I'm saying it'd be, I, I want to, um, I actually think it's a, it's a great way to weave in a few things we are seeing in the Q and a chat, because um, clearly uh there is despair. We're talking about also harm that is all about despair. Um, and it's overwhelmingly difficult. Absolutely. 
Um, the slow pace is really important, right? I, I think one of the things I want to post to you all as we begin to close out this conversation is how do we, you know, kind of face that, that there's going to be slow, slow change, right? Like the, the work of justice and, um, and harm repair is slow, but also um, what, ha- what successes, I guess, have we seen in the shorter term? Um, and to, to speak to another question that make it not just an academic exercise. I think we certainly do not want people to leave this conversation thinking that this is both a, a conversation just in the academy, um, but also that it's just a thought exercise, right? So Kelly, you've mentioned you know material conditions of people's lives. Um, Lisa and Gloria, you've mentioned other dimensions of you know policy change. Um, so and, and then lastly, um, uh, weaving in this question about. Um, well, going back actually to, to victims or impacted people, um, when we think about those who've been impacted by the very histories of harm that we're talking about, um, you know, whose voices get to be heard and, and also, you know, are we listening to their demands? So I'll give, um, that, that's woven in, I think, quite a number of the themes of the questions I see in the chat. And uh, I'd certainly love to hear from the three of you um, about what I've I've just mentioned. Um, so I guess if it's okay with you all, I might go uh, Kelly, Lisa, Gloria. Um, so Kelly, I don't know if you want to kick us off with with some thoughts. Yeah, um, how have we not fallen into despair? Um, the, um, question, the, 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 the predicate of that, we we actually have. <laughs> no, so it's not that we haven't. Um, no, the work is just too important um, for me. I find it very um, invigorating uh, because it's an opportunity to use the um, the privileges I have, which is time and resources, right, um, to bring uh, data to bear uh, on questions um, that are so important and indeed are urgent um, in the United States and globally. And so I think um, there is a fair amount of despair. These are very difficult topics. Um, I think this is also why I went the um, academic rather than the practitioner route in terms of truth commissions and transitional justice. Um, a shout out to the South Africa Commission. I don't want to trash it. Um, it was really good. Um, but that's one of the times when um, the, that was one of the early times that there was a realization that even people who were collecting data and hearing statements and, you know, um, writing reports, right, that there was um, a psychological toll and that there needed to be um, care um, for people who were maybe were not participating and sharing their stories, but who were taking in um, all of these stories. Um, and so for me, I uh, I think one way of self care in this work um, that I've kind of baked into my research agenda is focusing on the institutional, right? Um, and, um, and for people who are in trauma studies or sociology or anthropology, you know, kind of leaving that, um, that in commission um, or in process work um, to them because it really is um, very difficult. I like that we are a slow moving field and I think we should be, um, uh, and I think it's good that I, we are, becoming slower than we were previously. The 90s were a time of such great optimism. Um, You know, there was the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and for the former Yugoslavia, justice and accountability for everyone. And there was, you know, Truth Commission in South Africa, everyone, truth and reconciliation for you, truth and reconciliation for you. Just so there was kind of this unbridled joy and optimism about being able to redress human rights violations and violations of humanitarian law of international criminal law and that you know we had we had it solved and i think that um raised expectations um too high in terms of um, the deterrent capabilities um, of these mechanisms including courts and even the establishment of the international criminal court you know that this was going to deter crime um that has not been the case in terms of serious international crimes. Um, There isn't really an empirical basis for that, but there's all of this optimism. I think it's now with the benefit of time that we are able to look back um, with a a more critical eye and have been able to follow progress or um, the lack thereof, or perhaps less progress than we would have liked or hoped or expected um, in um, in these different places. And so, it's the, it's, we are doing the work of history. And that means, you know, being critical in the present, 
acknowledging the small um, successes along the way, but really uh, not being so ready to conclude um, about the success of the overall process, because in 5, 10, 20, 30 years, we may find, you know, ourselves uh, listening to, you know, um, a panel of the next generation of scholars saying, hey, they were way too optimistic about this thing, or maybe they were way too pessimistic. And that is um, an outcome um, about which I would be delighted. Um, but I think, yeah, I think we must, um, I think, chasten ourselves um, in terms of what we can expect and also what we tell publics in terms of what they can expect. I think managing expectations is a number one priority of TJ everywhere. Um, and so taking that into account. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think that uh, managing expectations piece is, is so uh, is such an insight. Thank you. Um, and, and also, I think what you've touched on of, um, you know, where the organizing for the commissions themselves come from. You know, I see mention of the Greensboro Commission, North Carolina in the chat, you know, the, the commissions that come out of grassroots efforts, which is the versus those, you know, mandated from a government level. But the grassroots still needing the government, you know, support both as a, um, you know, a legitimizer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, it's there's it's a both and. And I just appreciate so much of, of what you've just shared, Kelly. Um, Lisa, uh, over to you. And, and for those watching, we're going to we're going to go past one. So if you can stay with us until 115, um, we really appreciate it. Over to you, Lisa. I think you've are ask the hardest question. <laughs> I've been trying to think about the best approach uh, to answering it. Uh, the first, just saying, you know, one of the reasons for conceptualizing the April panel on mental health and resilience is because this question keeps coming up in every conversation that I'm a part of. And, you know, as someone who has been doing human rights work uh, for two decades, and I have to say, um, yes, I'm an activist, a, an academic, but a research activist is the way I look at it. And a whole purpose of creating this community is for that very reason, to be a community and to be supported. And what I find is that when you're doing your work in isolation, it can create such despair. But when you're a part of a conversation, you realize, wow, there's so much going on. And, and I think that's so important that we stay in conversation, which was a part of the motivation of creating the network in part also to raise awareness because the more people who are a part of this, the more likely that it's going to be normalized in a sense of a part of our, even our cultural language, the way that we talk about things. And I always say that, you know, teaching my students is a part of how I make this difference. And I've been teaching transitional justice for since 2008. I always teach about the U.S. And up until recently, my students were always like, ah, you're dreaming. This would never happen here. And, and now that's not the conversation. And they're hopefully going out into the world, you know, maybe not directly working on this, but at least informed citizens who have a say in how this happens. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think just like Kelly, there's so much self-care that needs to be done. And quite frankly, in law school, we do a terrible job of teaching that. But in my own journey, finding a way um, to make sure that you take care of yourself, you have to do that to keep doing this work. I just want to mention a, a really great um uh, I just I haven't read it, but I just heard about uh, Larry Ward, he, America's Racial Karma, uh, a book he wrote. He's, he was inspired by Thich Nhat Hanh, who just passed away, a Buddhist monk, in talking about uh, his shift in understanding that he's just a drop, but he is the ocean. And at the end of the day, if we each do our part, um, for me, there's been a lot of growth um, hard growth um, in the past couple of years of being a part of this, but it's now come to my country. Um, and so that's my part. And so, yes, it's it can be so hard, but if we stay in conversation, I think that's what makes it easier. And I also want to mention for those practitioners who have seen in the chat that the Mary Hawk Center is doing a course on all of this. Um, and so if anybody's interested in learning about how to actually get into the, the nuts and bolts of this. Um, obviously, ICTJ also, but feel free to reach out um, to me and I can put you in touch with them as well about the course this spring. Thank you, Lisa. Um, really appreciate all of, all of what you just shared. Uh, over to you, Gloria. All right, as an eternal optimist, I try not to uh, get too, um, 
concerned or fall into despair um, when we're dealing with these really difficult and complicated issues. Um, it, it's it's a very heavy um, subject matter, but um, honestly, um, in teaching um, a class on transitional justice and truth commissions over the past few years, I have actually been energized and um, I, I, I get the sense that the next generation of practitioners and scholars is really going to move the, the ball forward in terms of, of this really important work on um, truth telling accountability and uh, reconciliation. Um, what we have to remember is even though truth commissions um, are not the end all solution for addressing these issues, they offer something that traditional modes of accountability don't, and that's centering the voices of victims, the most important um, group in this conversation. And even though there has been um, some scholarship and some studies that talk about the, the problems with re-traumatizing victims who participate in these processes, that of course must be acknowledged um, for some, the, the benefit of participating in truth and reconciliation processes is that they get to understand the truth about what has affected their communities, the violence, the human rights violations that affected their communities, the harm that was caused to them and their families, um, being able to know where their family members were buried, for example, um, knowledge that they did not have before that um, the, the work of truth commissions has really been um, central in, in doing. So in, while we must remain realistic about the limitations of uh, truth commissions and similar processes, we still have to acknowledge that they are valuable and then work to actually make them better. And so I think I would leave us all with that, thinking about the ways in which we can um, employ these mechanisms um, for seeking justice and accountability and potentially um, reconciling um, societies while acknowledging their limitations. So um, I will end there. Thank you, Gloria. That was really beautifully put and um, just uh, a really beautiful way to close out uh, our comments. Um, in, in this part of the discussion. So thank you, Gloria, Lisa, and Kelly so much. Um, we have the pleasure, immense pleasure of hearing now um, from Sushma Raman, um, the executive director of the Carr Center here at the Kennedy School, who will uh, also provide a way for us to really make meaning out of um, what we've heard from all of you. Um, over to you, Sushma, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Erica, Khalil, and Miriam, and the Ash Center staff, as well as our amazing speakers today. I was frantically taking notes and posting on my Twitter account. And I, I really think that I need some time to digest this incredibly rich conversation, as well as the chat, which was such a wonderful compliment to all of the ideas that were shared today. I just wanted to share a few observations and thoughts from someone who, who is really coming to this work as um, primarily a practitioner, you know, having worked uh, both domestically and globally. And, you know, we are in the current context in a situation where we are uh, facing a few different threats that impact the work that uh, scholars and practitioners are trying to advance. The first is the rise of authoritarianism around the world, including elected authoritarians who are really trying to subvert democracy. And um, second is uh, connected to this trend is the undermining of democratic institutions, often using those very institutions and the frames of democracy and liberty and freedom uh, in order to advance their own agendas. Um, and third, the closing of civic space around the world that is occurring through the uh, repression of human rights organizations, journalists, indigenous communities, um, organizations led by members of um, you know, disadvantaged communities. And, um, you know, Kelly earlier uh, addressed the issue of needing a robust civil society, both locally and globally. And this is a trend that is continuing unabated. So we saw this similar to this sort of 
um, you know, booming of transitional justice and a real optimism. There was this optimism around the role of civil society and of human rights, and we are increasingly seeing that under threat. There are significant implications for us as we look forward. The first, as several of our speakers and Erica commented, the really the need to look introspectively for those people who work in the United States or who live in the United States. It's very hard to be pointing a finger or trying to develop global institutions for accountability in different parts of the world when that does not include, um, you know, looking at oneself and one's track record in the past, but also in the more recent uh, past. And that is really, really imperative for us to really think about justice. Uh, in a global way. The second is the need for strong democratic institutions, um, for institutions that protect and preserve democracy for everyone. So that includes a free press, it includes uh, legal institutions, other forms of uh, um, institutions and sectors. And in this regard, I would say that there's a need for our sectors to examine inequality and, and racial discrimination, gender discrimination within our own institutions because we are all complicit. So um, whether you're working in academia or you're working in human rights organizations based in the global north um, or you're working in legal uh, organizations, it is imperative upon us to look at how do our mission, vision, and values actually get reflected in our staffing, in our leadership, in um, the decisions that we make, because it is otherwise hypocritical for us to, again, look externally for justice when we are not seeking it internally. And I think in this sense, the work of IRA is really important in really thinking about anti-racism within institutions and how to ensure accountability. There was a lot that I heard in the audience questions and feedback, and I think um, the answers that you led that you left me with were really ones that were thought provoking about the balance of working slowly versus quickly, the balance of ensuring um, adequate processes of inclusion of survivors, of inclusion of affected communities versus the outcomes that some folks in the um, chat posted, like where's the success, where's the impact, what's an example of uh, you know, a process that worked well. And I think that as we look to the future, uh, we do need to remain both realistic and optimistic in order to ensure um, that the work continues and that uh, we can prevail. So I'd like to just close on that note and then turn it back to you, Erica and Khalil for including me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sushma. Uh, absolutely uh, optimistic and, and realistic uh, is, is, I think, a great way to encapsulate um, what we've heard today. Um, and just so grateful to have um, you here in the space, Sushma, as well as um, Dr. Lisa LaPlante, Dr. Gloria Ayi, and Dr. Kile Bugile uh, Zrobo. Um, I'm, I apologize, Zrobo. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us and for sharing uh, your wisdom and uh, and just years of research uh, and and commitment with us. I think what what's energized all of us today, I think, is just the commitment that you all have to this work and to seeing it through. Um, so. Thank you all. Uh, thank you to the Car Center, um, to the Ash Center teams, um, as well as our research assistants, Retna Gill and Rai, um, for their social media support. For everyone watching, um, please stay connected with us and all of the efforts you've heard about today um, from our scholars and their institutes. And uh, please be well.